I think that knowing what works and why it works is absolutely crucial for almost any part of government. Uh, and so, to my mind, in, in any government system, there needs to be serious attention to ensuring there are processes and structures whose job it is to be constantly asking, does this work or not? Um, now, this has quite a few consequences. One is, um, certainly in countries like the UK, we found there were no institutions playing that role. This is why we created new What Works centres in the last five years to play this role. We are, for example, at Nesta, currently incubating a new one for children's social care for the government to help social workers who are trying to help children from very troubled families, problematic lives, to help them know what the evidence says about what works or what doesn't. So this is what one part. The second is, I think, a big culture change in some governments, which is saying instead of introducing a policy at the level of a whole region or province or nation, it may often be much more efficient to try it out in a small scale to see which elements of it work before you take it to large scale. Uh, this has been a commitment of the Trudeau government in Canada, uh, in Finland, and a few other countries are now trying to embed experimentalism into the way government works. It means slightly slower results, but much stronger results, because you can get rid of the ideas which look good on paper, but don't work in practice. And then thirdly, I think in every public sector now, we need to ensure we are constantly gathering data to find out in real time if there are surprising patterns. Again, if a teaching method or a welfare policy, which we thought would work, doesn't work, let's ensure we are able through data to spot that quickly so we can change and adapt. I think the commitment to serious evaluation goes in cycles in governments. And in the last few years, in many countries, the sheer pressure on government from austerity and financial crisis uh, means that politicians have seen less value from evaluation. They are struggling to survive, to hold things together uh, in ways which are less true when you're in a steady economic growth. Um, I think there's also been a problem with the evaluation method that in the classic methods when I first worked in government, we would run a pilot project for three or four years. There would then be one or two years of evaluation, and then the results would come back to the government maybe seven years after the policy had started. People don't have that patience anymore. So what's needed are much quicker ways of getting some insights into what is working. Um, many of the randomized control trials which we run in fields like economics and education, try and generate some feedback within a year or two. Sometimes within a few weeks you can discover what works. So this is where, again, the help, the use of digital technologies plus evaluation methods, plus often um, faster ways of embedding evaluation into daily management helps to solve this problem. Let me give you an example. In some cities in, uh, in Europe, police officers have become very keen to evaluate and so they try out experiments where they will use one method of dealing with perhaps vehicle crime in one neighborhood but leave another neighborhood as a control or a third with a, a slightly different model and then within a few weeks they can get some data as to what is working and what is not and this in a way takes evaluation uh, perhaps away from being a big fat report yeah. which comes at the end of the project to being embedded in how day-to-day -day public sector management works. And I suspect this is more likely to, uh, to work in many political environments than the traditional slow but very rigorous and serious methods of testing policies. When, when I used to work in the UK government, I ran the strategy and policy team, we tried hard to improve what we called evidence-based policy. Um, but in practice, we made many mistakes. Uh, we created centers in universities, we created repositories of evidence, but they weren't used. So more recently, through Nesta, we have advocated really a very different approach, which focuses more on the demand for evidence, the use of evidence by police officers or teachers or doctors or policy makers in municipal government. 
Uh, we advocated the creation of what we call what work centers to become specialist organizations helping each field understand what the evidence said to make it very easy to use, easy to digest. And we've run training programs for civil servants, but also for politicians. We do them at the big uh, political party congresses to help raise the status of evidence, to get them to understand that if they want to succeed, they need to be much more serious about finding out what works and what doesn't. And this, is, this has had a big effect. I think we are seeing much more progress in embedding evidence into daily life. And of course, increasingly, that is also helped by data because public services generate so much data now, whether it's about school results or transport movement patterns or crime levels. These are a fantastic uh, really supplement to, in some ways, quite traditional methods of evaluation and assessment. The problem in the public sector usually is there are no machineries for innovation. They don't have budgets, as you would have in a company or in science. There aren't specialized skills. There are not well-structured laboratories. There are often a lack of assessment mechanisms to spot good innovations and help them uh, spread. So unfortunately, almost all the elements are missing, even though public officials and servants are often, as individuals, highly creative and innovative. So I would say that the, the challenge is very much parallel to what faced science 100, 120 years ago. Then they had lots of creative scientists, but no system. And then a system was put in place with R&D funding, laboratories, mechanisms and processes, and we live with the benefits today. We need something similar in the public sector. There's a big challenge all over the world in updating the skills of public servants. Uh, and one of the things uh, Nestor has been doing with a, a group of governments around the world is de developing a new curriculum for the public service. We call it States of Change. Uh, it launches in November 2017 with partners from Singapore to Finland to the US. And this is focused partly on the technical skills. So it's absolutely true. Governments need many more data scientists, computer scientists, people who understand what can be done with digital tools. But there are also other missing skills. There aren't many people in governments who know how to, how to experiment, how to test things out, how to tap into collective intelligence and use the new tools there. Design methods are still very weak in many governments around the world. So in our view, we need quite a comprehensive overhaul of what it means to be a 21st century public servant. And most of these things are learnt not so much through sitting in a classroom, but through doing things and then learning from the experience of doing with the help of a, a specialist professional. I've had a, a long-standing interest in how do you do strategy in the public sector. And there's a huge literature on strategy in warfare, how you win wars, and in business, how you defeat your competitor. Um, but when I was asked by British Prime Minister to create a strategy unit, we found almost no guidance as to what strategy means in a public context, where you are having to serve the public, an electorate, a democratic uh, context. Mm -hmm. And so in work um, in the UK and Australia and other countries have tried to put together a public approach to strategy making to make it easier for governments to think and act long term. Because the vice of democracy is our horizons often shrink right down to 24-hour news cycles or having to win the next election, which is unavoidable. But I think governments serve their citizens best if they also look 10, 20, 30 years into the future. You know, what skills do children now need, children in schools, if they're going to thrive in the, the labor market of 20 years' time? What do we need to be doing for infrastructure or for the environment? Again, to be ready for the future so that in a generation or two's time, they look back and thank government for what it did today, yeah. uh, not blame it. These are in some ways very simple ideas, um, but uh, I, I've tried to sort of make them quite crisp, you know, precise what that means in terms of use of everything from forecasting and scenarios tools to understand the future to experiment and innovation in the present. 
And one of the disappointing things for me of the last few years is there is huge interest in these ideas in some parts of the world, in East Asia, in the Gulf, but the old democracies have tended to shrink away from strategy and become much more short-termist in their behavior. The 19th century model of government divided everything into most functional silos. So you have a, yeah, a ministry or department for education, one for police, one for transport, one for energy. And there were good reasons for doing that 100 years ago. Communication was very expensive. It was more efficient to have a, a hierarchical line. In recent years, this structure of government has increasingly got in the way of solving big problems. Problems of social exclusion, problems of climate change, problems of aging, which cut right across those departmental uh, structures. And so in the last few years, there's been some experiment with trying to create horizontal overlays to the vertical silos. Uh, that can be cross-cutting teams, uh, budgets which are pooled, targets which are shared across government, and crucially sharing data and knowledge as well. But I think it's true to say this movement has still been very modest. In most governments, it's at most 2, 4, 5% of budgets are organized horizontally. And the inertia of the old vertical silo system is extraordinary. And to my mind, extraordinarily inefficient in, in many ways. We are still looking for governments to be really bold enough to, to grasp the potential of our current technologies, which make it possible to organize things in much more flexible ways. Sometimes with short-term project teams solving problems, two or three year uh, pool budgets, all alongside professions which have deep pools of knowledge about you know, how you cure people or how you run energy systems, but organized in very different ways. And business has actually been much more creative and flexible in combining horizontal and vertical structures than governments have been. I think for public servants, it's really important now to be on the side of hope and optimism. Many public servants in many countries have quite a negative self-image. They think they are slow moving, they resist change, they are not innovative, perhaps compared to business and, other, uh, and science and other fields. And yet, in my view, good public service has done more for human well-being than anything else, by a long margin. The worst thing can happen to any society is to have an incompetent government. <laughs> it's far worse than anything else. And, of course, the public sector has, in some cases, been extraordinarily good at innovation, from getting a man on the moon to things like the World Wide Web and the Internet. These all came from public institutions. And in recent years, we have seen extraordinary public sector innovations, uh, like in India, where I was a few weeks ago, where over a billion people now have a biometric identity card, a huge project of vast ambition, which has had dramatic effects already on the well-being of hundreds of millions of people. So 1.2 billion people have, have this card. So we need to restore our confidence, our faith in the vocation of public service. And I think linked to that, be able to articulate a positive future of where our societies might be going. In many parts of Europe and North America, many citizens now think things are getting worse. They expect their children to be worse off than they were. We've become sort of locked in a spiral of pessimism, which actually isn't very rational. Uh, and I think the government, in a sensible way, has to be on the side of, of optimism and hope, because when you do that, you unlock the resources of, of creativity and inspiration and citizen engagement, which, in, which create a positive spiral of change, in turn, instead of the fatalism, the negative spiral, which we see so in so many places now.